Go live. All right, good evening, everybody. Hey, it's Mike Shower again down in the wonderful city of Juneau in our wonderful session, having a ball. Not really. So back to Dozer Speaks again, Dozer's Debriefs, whatever in the world you want to call it. Going to keep talking to you every week what's going on down here, what we're seeing, being transparent. So FYI, and I'm told I need to be entertaining. So I thought I was. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to pull my hands out a little bit. There I was. Maybe I'm going to go over and pull up a little Raptor model here, and we'll just talk about flying airplanes as it kind of goes across the screen like that. So I'm just kidding a little bit. That's my sense of humor. You guys know how I am. So <clears throat> here's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to try to keep them a little bit shorter. I've got my senior policy advisor, Scott Ogan, former legislator, here with me tonight. We're going to talk about a few things. History, um, here's what's kind of going on and what kind of drove tonight in having two of these. Because tomorrow, as a teaser for you, there's going to be some things coming out. and We're going to talk again tomorrow night. So you may want to tune in for that one, too, because many of you have been asking me, what are you going to do, Mike? Why are you taking it? You're just taking it on the chin. I'm like, eh, maybe not. You guys know me. I'm not just going to lay down and take this. Because if I see something that's wrong, I'm going to try to correct it. That's who I am. So... Stand by, just pay attention, and we'll talk tomorrow night on some more things coming that way. That's all I'll say about tonight for tomorrow. But for tonight, many people continue to have a narrative about the PFD that is not correct. And so what I want to do here, um, I'm sorry, I just got to say that. My wife just crawled right under here <laughs> under the camera, and I'm just laughing at the whole thing. This is the end. I'm just I'm looking down, and go, there she goes, right under the camera so she can't be seen. Ah, well, you have to know. This is a very professional operation here, folks. <laughs> All right, so I'm seeing what I what is a narrative I don't believe is correct, and the narrative is to try to change and pivot. on the table and say, this is kind of what it is. You make your own mind up about whether you think it needs to be you know, spent on the government, if it needs to be given to the people. That's for you to decide. I have to make my own choices too. So let's just get going here and we're going to talk about a couple things and I'm going to fold Scott into the discussion. The discussion. So let's talk about history. <clears throat> Why was the PFD or the permanent fund created in the dividend? I had a fascinating chance to talk to Jerry J. Hammond's uh, chief of staff. Or he was with him for a long time couple years ago, fascinating discussion, straight from the horse's mouth. Somebody was there, watched the guy get up out of his chair every day. He wasn't like, you know, third or fourth, you know, hand information passed down about what it was really for. And he told me at the time some of the things I say. He's like, Mike, you're, you're on the right track for what Jay really intended for this. And I've read some of the books and the quotes and other things that are out there. So, you know, when you go back to why was it created, really one of his points was to take a Unrenewable resource, our oil, if you will, that we pump down the pipeline, we get paid for it with royalties and taxes, etc., and then it's gone. And what will government do? We will spend it, and then it's just, poof, there is no more. He's like, let's take some of this wisely, invest it in the stock market, and it, it morphed a little bit over time, but now we'll get a perpetual, hopefully, return on our resources that have been extracted from the state. That's really kind of the bottom line of, of how this kind of came out of it. You're going to get lots of people who are going to say negative things, too. That's fine. You can have your opinion. I'm just telling you the people I've talked to listened, you know, because I wasn't around when that happened up here. So what was it used for? What was kind of the intent? Well, the use for part of it would be eventually if, if the renewable resource or the unrenewable resource of oil ran out, as we would have this perpetual source of income, and you would be able to offset some of the cost of government by using that. But as things also played out, Jay Hammond was very concerned about what politicians would do with the money. If we get our hands on money, as I've said before, government has an insatiable appetite, they will spend it. Poof, it's gone, right? We know that. And history shows this back and forth. So, he wanted his militant ring of Alaska citizens, by having a dividend, they were going to be invested in this, and you, the people, were going to be looking at this and go, whoa, wait a minute, what, you, want to take my you want to take money out of my wallet? <clears throat> and, wow, look at the last couple of years since Governor Walker started arbitrarily taking it a few years ago. Are the people engaged? I think that is a resounding yes. They are most certainly engaged in the process now. So I think that was very fortuitous when he looked in the future and said, yeah, I want to do this. Well, it certainly worked, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about land rights. I'm going to read something, and I want Scott to fold into this discussion because he's been around longer than I have, and I, I can't make any jokes here because I'll get in trouble. But let's just talk right out of Alaska statutes if we go back into this. So provided that any lands or minerals hereafter disposed of contrary to the provisions of this section shall be forfeited to the United States 
by appropriate proceedings instituted by the Attorney General for that purpose in the United States District Court for the District of Alaska. In other words, folks, what's being said is back to when the state was being created, the Statehood Act, um, it, we don't have our mineral rights. That's absolutely true. You cannot argue that. Our mineral rights, a few people in the state, some, some entities, some folks, have the, they own the land under the feet, but most of us do not. And it's right out of the book. And so I'm going to ask Scott to just talk for a moment here about that and how that played out because he was around when they've had some of these discussions to talk about why we don't own that and what would happen, which is important, if somehow we tried to change that. Scott? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, the Statehood Act was, was very uh, expressly, that provision that you just read, uh, put some pretty serious sidebars on if the state tried to dispose of the mineral estate to anyone else, um, it doesn't take an act of Congress. The Attorney General automatically is supposed to implement proceedings to take back all of the mineral rights. So if you can imagine all the oil on state leases on the North Slope, uh, Cook Inlet and everything, all of a sudden those go back to the feds. Because there have been, I see a number of uh, people that uh, every once in a while somebody says, well, why don't we just get our mineral rights, you know, what, let's, why can't we buy our mineral rights or whatever. Now, certain pieces of land that were patented before statehood came with uh, the only mineral, with no mineral reservation. And so pre-statehood land that was patented, actually some people do own mineral rights. I have known a piece of land like that in Soldovia, but they're far and few between. So, but that permit fund represents a, an, an actual dividend from that uh, mineral right that's held in trust by all the people. And the legislature is, are the trustees of the, of the natural resources in, 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 of, of Alaska, and they have a trust responsibility to manage those resources in the best interest of Alaskans, which pays a royalty. It's kind of like you have stock in, in, in investments or something like that. You get a royalty from that stock investment. I would challenge, I think you've, I've heard you say people in, uh, in this building um, have, uh, you know, received royalties from various endowments or trusts or those kind of things. That isn't welfare. That's something that is, is, is a heritage uh, asset. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. Okay. It's a good segue into this. So just a few more things about you know what Jay said, if you go back to that as an example, he's like, these are his words. I wanted to encourage contributions into the investment account and to protect against its invasion by politicians by creating a militant ring of dividend recipients who would resist any such usage if, the, if it affected their dividends. Wow, are we seeing that battle today? I want to transform oil wells pumping oil for a finite period into money wells pumping money for infinity, like I talked about before. I wanted to install a sense of ownership in all Alaskans that would incline them to support healthy resource development and resist unhealthy versions okay so let's continue on here and i'll need this piece of paper here in a minute so back to that so let's talk about offset of mineral rights that was kind of part of the process right we just kind of explained that that you're offsetting that and it's useful for both the state and for the people and how it came, came about economic impact is it big yes it is we're talking at this point almost two billion dollars a year into the economy or in this case a lot less than that because we've been deciding to just take that and pay for government arbitrarily on our own not following the statute got it Quality of life for people. Some people talk about the economic impact. It's a little bit. It's not the, it's, it comes once a year, right? But the quality of life for people is significant. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And some of the revenue, I think, was truly, and eventually it would go to government. All right? So there's a split here, but it's not all to that. So let's talk a little bit about conservative and libertarian views, right? Here's what I think there's a the difference here of philosophy for some people, depending on where you sit on the political spectrum, whether you're wealthy, poor, whatever it happens to be. Those of us that are more in the conservative or libertarian viewpoint our view of money, in this case, money in the hands of the private sector is far better than money in the hands of the public sector. We have discussed this before. There are clearly times where we believe that building bridges, maintaining roads is more of a collective responsibility, public safety. There's things, you know, national defense that we've agreed collectively we're going to get together to, to do that, right? But come on. I mean, really, if the more money you give government, it's like somebody mentioned to me once, I think it was Scott, actually, he's like, you know, giving uh, money to government is like giving sugar to cancer. It just grows, and it's going to just suck it all up and keep using it. So that's kind of a philosophical difference. So let's jump over today, then. What's the narrative today as we kind of zip through this? So here's kind of the things you're hearing. It used to be, it was, the earnings went to the permanent fund, into the corpus, and they've been growing it. And then the rest went to a dividend after inflation proofing and other things are taken out. What's happening now and has been happening for a couple of years? The earnings are now going to the government, not to, back into the corpus, and they're going to the dividend. 
or some small portion of them is going to the dividend, right? Here's some of the things you're hearing about people in the building, certain legislators and others that are saying things about it in certain special interest groups and lobbyists and others. It destroys lives. It has great social impacts. Well, there's not real any indication other than I heard somebody tell me today there's like 350 people every time the dividend checks come out. Study after study after study, which I haven't seen, appears that you know we're all destroying our lives in Alaska every time the dividend checks come out, but this data doesn't support that. That's a few people reaching for some thread they can pull on to try to continue to take the PFD to fund bigger government. That's the bottom line. Um, social impacts, they scream about that all day long, but you know I'm going to talk about what those social impacts were it's really coming from, and it's not a dividend check once a year. Okay, that's not what's driving all this. You're going to have a blip in anything, that's not it. I hear this over and over again about welfare. It's a welfare check. It's a handout. It's free money. I'm here to tell you folks, it is not. And we're going to talk about why it is not here in a minute. Okay? It's socialism. It's socialism. I'm scratching my head and I kind of went back and I looked at this and I go, well, what is socialism? It's an economic and political system based on public or collective ownership of the means of production which emphasizes equality rather than achievement. Hmm. The main difference between capitalism and socialism is the extent of government intervention in the economy. A capitalist economic system is characterized by private ownership of assets and business. A, ca a capitalist economy relies on a free market to determine price, incomes, wealth, and distribution of goods. It got me to thinking a little bit. I'm like, you know, socialism? I'm like, wait a minute. What about capitalism? What did we do with our money? Our resources of this state were extracted. They were pumped down the pipeline. Money was then given to the stock market. We invested it. We got a return for it, our reward, and we split that return amongst all eligible Alaskans. Um, last time I checked, that's capitalism. You're investing your money. Socialism takes your money, especially tax money out of hardworking producers, right? And it redistributes it. I'm kind of scoffing the socialism idea in this, folks. I'm not buying it for this whole thing, okay? Right? So let's go from the black stuff here as far as the, the, the writing and switch over to blue and talk a little bit more about, you know, these are what people are saying. They're trying to drive the narrative and tell you how bad it is and we need to get rid of it and it's free money and all these things, trying to keep us to a time limit here. And we're going to talk about some of the, the positive things, okay? Because it's all negative and we need to take it. And, you know, even one more, I should have put this up here, but as a Republican and talking about the Republican Party platform and maybe with a pretty strong conservative libertarian bent, what are some Republican ideals? Certainly it's money in the hands of the private sector is better than public. It is certainly, um, we want smaller government, but if legislators in this building are not going to reduce the budget, which we don't seem to be inclined to do, and I talked about that last week in Facebook Live, I'm kind of thinking a lot of the legislators that claim to be a Republican might be looking a little more towards that socialism side of this one here because that PFD being taken from you out of the private sector is going to the public sector. And that money is going straight into the hands of government. And it is being redistributed as they, they, they see fit, whatever they want to do with it. Kind of, you know, I think we're getting the, the what was that, Ghostbusters? It's like we're crossing the streams. I think we're crossing the streams a little bit here, folks. Does it help small businesses? You're darn right it does. And I can't tell you how many people... Going through our district a couple of years ago when we were campaigning, and um, we got this over and over again. Small businesses that were struggling through the wintertime. So we know for a fact it's a big bump to get you over that winter. It's slow in Alaska. It's a big deal. Uh, and, and I can't tell you how many business owners talk to small business owners. It's about roughly almost $2 billion in the economy. You're going to tell me that doesn't make an impact? $2 billion of cash injected? We've been ripping a $1 billion roughly out of it every year. That matters, folks. That matters. No matter what you say about the rest of this, that matters. ICER has put, when you talk study after study after study, ICER has put out that this is really the most regressive tax we could come up with. It affects every Alaskan that is eligible. And by the way, it hurts the poorest, the most vulnerable amongst us that supposedly certain groups care about. It hurts them the most. Because if you take a family, and I didn't have time to find it and print it, I should have. I saw one person put out there and did the math, and over the last four or five years of taking the dividend, of a family, I think it was four or five, it's like $22,000, $23,000, don't hold me to the, the numbers, uh, has been taken from them. And for some people, if you're like a mom and a dad, you know, working um, jobs that are not, you know, the highest paying jobs, you could be talking 15, 20% of their income for the year, okay? So I hear people talking about, oh, it's, it's a handout, it's all this kind of stuff. You know what I get, folks? I'll tell you what I hear in my district. I hear people saying they are buying tires for their car when it comes out. They are buying heating oil. For the winter time, getting stacks of wood, cords of wood to help them get through the winter, clothes on their kids' back, food on the table. That's the kind of stuff I'm hearing about where it helps. This, uh, the rest of this narrative that it's just free money and the stuff that's going on and the social impacts. 
So you want to talk about some of that right now? Let's talk about social impacts. PFD, right? Once a year, a little bit. I got news for you, folks. You're not moving to Alaska from some other state for a check once a year, even if you have a couple kids. You can't survive on that. You want to talk about reform in this state and get to a point where it makes a difference? Why don't we talk about having the most lax welfare rules in the country? Why don't we talk about the Medicaid expansion under Walker that's breaking the bank? Those are things that make a difference for us. The PFD is minuscule when you tie these things together. And if I'm looking for the bills, just like I am about reducing the budget, show me where the bills are that are taking care of these things. So far, I'm not seeing them. So is it true that we really want to reduce the cost of government if you're a Republican or others? I would argue it's not. Is it true we really want to reduce the operating cost of government? I would argue it's not. All people want to do is spend more money in this building, not all, but many, and they want to use the PFT to pay for it. Take it out of your pocket. That's what this comes down to. It's the easiest answer, folks. It's one the courts have given them top cover on. They can just, with the majority, go take that money. Okay? That's how it's happening. Now, I'm going to give you one more example because some people in this building talk about the free money all the time, right? So let me ask you this one. This is a dividend, right? So let's just say that a legislator had uh, an endowment set up and they were getting money from it every month, right? Legislators here are making the argument, well, this dividend that we have an endowment set up, right, that we are getting money from the stock market, apparently it is a handout. It's welfare. So if there's a legislator or legislators in this building that are getting money from some kind of endowment or handout, it must be welfare or handout. But I'm here to tell you, I bet that's not what they'll say. Strange how it's not good for the goose, but good for the gander or something like that, because I don't remember exactly how that one works. All right. So, in a nutshell, folks, what I wanted to talk about just briefly, and I'm going to take a knee here, <laughs> is what I see happening is a narrative that's driving us towards the PFD is all for the government. The PFD is only to pay for government, and the leftovers go to the people. I don't believe that was the intent of Jay Hammond and some of the original folks that set it up, and I've talked to enough people to get that impression. I don't believe that it's doing some of the things that people today are claiming, I think what they want to do is they want to take it to grow government. And as I've heard legislators say in the last couple of years here, if you don't spend government money, you don't have a constituency. Think about that comment, okay? So this is what I see, and I just want to capture the narrative back so that people can look at this and go, you know, there's more to this PFD discussion and how we got here. What we do with it is open for debate. We're clearly debating that right now. We're getting income. In fact, it is the highest amount of income we're getting from any sources coming from the earnings of the dividend. If we want to have a debate about how we use this, if the math works out, I'm all for that. I got it. But I don't want the narrative behind me to be hijacked by some that simply want to say, well, it's a free money thing, it's a welfare check, it's this, that. No, it's not. And we're going to argue and debate this from a factual standpoint, not from emotions or what people want to do with it. And that's why I want to sit and talk to you tonight about this one for a little bit. Uh, and then we'll have the debate. And from there, you decide, right? This is the, what was that, Bill O'Reilly thing? You decide. No spend facts here. We're just going to tell you what I see out of this, and then you decide if you want to spend it on government. You decide if the PFD is more important. That debate's coming, folks. We have to have it. We're not there for that one yet, but this is for tonight. Since we're coming up at uh, 18, 19 minutes, I want to stop it. I'll okay, give you one more thing. One more thing to talk about. They veto override and how they stacked it the deck. Thank you, Scott. He was here to remind me, make sure I'm getting all these things right, and I'm probably talking so fast I'm rolling over any discussion between the two either. of us. <laughs> so, yes, um, this is quite interesting. Remember last year and last week I told you about the amount of uh, bills that I've seen? And almost none of them are talking about reducing the cost of government like I was promised would happen last year. Not that I'm overly surprised. But, strangely, what you will see in both the House and the Senate, a bill has been filed, a constitutional amendment, to change the veto override. So instead of the three-quarters required, which is a very high hurdle to jump over, now it's only two-thirds required. Okay? So I'm going to tie it to a couple things here. What that means is, those veto overrides that the governor used last summer, that some supported and some didn't, etc., they're lowering the bar. This is dangerous ground, folks. Dangerous ground. We are lowering the bar on the constitutional side where it takes less legislators, right, to overrule something than it did before. And the only reason they're doing that is because of what happened last year. They are angry that they could not get enough legislators to override the vetoes. They couldn't do it again when they pulled it another time here a couple weeks ago on the you know, first couple days of this session this year. And when you look at the reorganization, and I go back to what happened to myself and others when we were stripped of chairmanships, and this is going through the House and the Senate, wow, it's kind of funny that some of us that were there that supported those vetoes and not the overrides are removed from our chairs. 
And we're not in a position to block this change. But people that supported overriding the vetoes and spending more government money and taking more of your PFD are in some of these positions, both in the House and the Senate. And it is ripping through fast. I just got a note today, that's why I'm highlighting this, is that uh, it's already moving through the House of Finance, and it got like a couple of committees, and their, their intent is to shove this one down fast, folks, and get it. Um, and the governor can't veto it. They had to go before you, right? So this is fascinating that this is happening, but just FYI, um, some people that are angry about what happened last year, they didn't like the answer, so now they're going to try to change the Constitution on it. So pay attention to that one, maybe take a look at it. I just wanted to highlight that because it just came to me right before this. I thought it was worthy of a couple minutes of describing it. But it's interesting when all these things come together about who is where. All right, Scott, what else? Please. You know, in this building, it's a lot easier to stop bad things from happening than it is to make good things from happening. And a committee chairman has the power to stop bad things to happen uh, from happening. So uh, I think the reorganization of the Senate had a lot more to, uh, uh, it was a lot more about that, Keep, keeping you and, and Senator Hughes especially, because you were on state affairs, Senator Hughes was on judiciary, and those two, a judiciary would definitely get the committee referral and state affairs for a constitutional amendment. And now that those rails are greased. So, you know, it's, it's not a pretty sight. It's fast-tracking things, folks. And, and as you can see, I think it starts to line up that there was way more happening behind the scenes here than just... Uh, one random vote about, uh, you know, an appropriation bill last summer or that, you know, some of us were outspoken on the radio and people didn't like it. There's a lot more going on in this building, folks. You're going to see some stuff coming up like a hook before. Pay attention, help me out, support where we are because we got things to change to make this place better if we can. I appreciate your time as always. I hope I've been a little bit more entertaining tonight. We'll see if I, what my feedback is. I'll get on Facebook uh, here in a little bit and I'll try to answer your questions. We are still planning to do one tomorrow night at 6.30 and we'll have a lot more to talk about on that one and see where we head and things are starting to move. So I appreciate your time as always from Juno. We will see you tomorrow night at 6.30. Be there, be square. Have a good night.